from Grub Street to Fleet Street. Grub Street was both a geographical location and a metaphor. Grub Street, the place, ran from, look, from just north of here, uh, from 4th Street up to Chiswell Street. It was renamed Milton Street in the 1830s. Unfortunately, only a couple of hundred yards have survived. The rest lies buried under the Barbican. The only things on a human scale is the wall of Whitbread's Brewery and uh, the St Paul's Tavern. Uh, some small consolation to the drunken ghosts of Grub Street. Grub Street was outside the city walls. It was in an area of poverty and vice, teeming with disreputable tenements, mean courts, low ale houses and dark alleys. Samuel Johnson said Grub Street was much inhabited by writers of small histories, by which he meant newspapers, dictionaries and temporary poems. And we know that some of the more destitute writers and printers lived in the area around Grub Street. Journalist too. Defoe was born just round the corner in Fall Street. He died in Rope Maker's Alley, one of the many dark passages that fell that fed into Grub Street, and at least one Civil War news book was published from Grub Street. In the 1860s and 1850s, with the explosion of news books and other unlicensed publications, the warrens surrounding Grub Street were the hiding places of fugitive printers lugging their moonshine presses from one garret to the next and trying to keep one step ahead of the authorities. The term Grub Street was first recorded in its non-geographical sense, in, a, in 1630, and it became more prevalent during the Civil War when both sides paid the authors of news books to fight a paper war on their behalf. With the formation of uh, political parties after the Restoration, the term became established to describe journalists, political pamphleteers, and other writers of ephemeral publications who, with neither a private income nor a wealthy patron, had to write for money in order to survive. Grub Street is a metaphor for the hack writer. The hack, the word hack, derives from hackney, originally meaning a horse for hire, and later a prostitute, a woman for hire. Finally, it was applied to a writer for hire, paid by the line, scratching a precarious living from the lower reaches of literature, including journalism. The Grub Street hack received no public acclaim. Instead, he received the sneers and jibes of his more successful contemporaries, who, by a mixture of ability and flattery, had found the security of a patron. His life was described by Hogarth in The Distressed Poet, pictured rather by Hogarth, and his condition was described by Ned Ward as very much like a strumpet. And if the reason be required why we betake ourselves to so scandalous a profession as whoring or pamphleteering, the same exclusive answer will serve us both, that the unhappy circumstances of a narrow fortune have forced us into doing this for our subsistence. In the eyes of the establishment, journalists were a semi-criminal class. Their uncertain way of life, with its irregular payment and vulnerability to the law, compelled them to live in the lower quarters of the city, such as the Grub Street area. They could make their living only by in a, living in a hackney kind of way by prostituting their pens to the highest bidder, Tories one day, Whigs the next, and all the time suffering har harassment from authority. But although maligned, venal, full of human failings, the men and women of Grub Street are the heroes of my book, risking prison, pillory and even death to publish the events of the day. They entertained and informed their readers. They enraged the establishment by having the audacity to criticise the powerful and by having the audacity to behave as if the, government, the conduct of government was any of their business. The pioneers of Grub Street laid the foundations of Fleet Street and the modern newspaper. Almost from the time that Caxton first introduced print into England in 1476, the state regarded the printing press as a dangerous weapon. The printing of news was doubly dangerous. It would lead the people to question the authority of the state. In 1538, Henry VIII decreed that all printed matter had to be approved by the Privy Council or its deputies before publication. In 
Even spoken news or rumour was prohibited by Edward VI's proclamations of 1547 and 1549. By 1581, the publication of seditious material had become a capital offence. And the only form of printed news that was permitted was either government propaganda, such as the first recorded news book, which was entitled Hereafter Ensue the True Encounter or Battle Lately Done Between Iglade and Scotland, which was a contemporary account of the Battle of Flodden in 1513, or broadsides of wonderful and strange news of witchcraft, murders and strange monsters. Titles like heavy news of an horrible earthquake, or a strange and terrible wonder wrought in the parish church of Bungay. And I quote, in a great tempest of violent rain, lightning and thunder, a horrible shaped thing was sensibly perceived of the people then and there assembled, which, in the twinkling of an eye, mortally wrung the necks of several worshippers. When the Thirty Years' War started in 1618, it was an intense interest to the London merchants who had dealings in Europe. And recognising this market for news, printers in Holland started producing English-language news books which were smuggled into this country. Fearful of losing control, the government licensed the first of a series of regular and numbered English news books in 1622. These were known as Carantos and were translations of continental news books, but due to Star Chamber censorship, they were forbidden to print English news. The abolition of the Star Chamber the collapse of Crown authority and the breakdown of censorship on the onset of the English Civil War marked the true beginnings of English journalism. And the first weekly news book of the newly freed press was started in November 1641 by a chap called Samuel Peck. Peck can therefore be described as the father of English journalism, and he was described by his contemporaries as a bald-headed buzzard, constant in nothing but wenching, lying and drinking. <laughs> What's not to like? <laughs> in the 1640s and 50s, over 300 different titles came into existence. Some were short-lived, one or two issues only, while others continued several years, and they mixed eyewitness reports of skirmishes and battles with conjecture and propaganda, each claiming uh, victory for battles they had lost. Here are two early English news books. One, this one here is just before the Civil War started, um, and this one is just after. Um, they're both 1642, and they're full of, um, you know, warlike preparations, skirmishes, battles, really exciting stuff. And unlike the news in the Carantos, which was of direct importance to a very restricted group, the events recorded in the Civil War news books affected everybody. And for a penny a tuppence a copy, they were read by a wide class of reader, especially in London, where male literacy in the 1640s was estimated at between 70 and 80 percent. The importance of the Civil War news books can't be overestimated, or can't be overstated, rather. News books of all sides demonised the others with stories of atrocities, and by recording the divisions between King and Parliament, Independent and Presbyterian, Army and Parliament, Grandees and Levellers, no one, however detached, who read the news books could imagine that England was a nation at peace with itself. The reader was compelled to take sides, and, thanks to the Civil War news books, the reader had developed a hunger for news. Not everyone was in favour of this newfound freedom of the press. One pamphleteer described journalists as this filthy avery, this moth-eaten crew of newsmongers, every jack sprat that hath but a pen in his inkhorn is ready to gather up the excrements of the kingdom. The leading journalist during the Civil War and Interregnum was Marchmont Nedham. I think he swore a lot. Contemporaries said he had a public brothel in his mouth. 
and despite changing sides twice, he wound up as Cromwell's chief spin doctor, editing the two official newspapers of the Protectorate. This is one of them, the Public Intelligence. Uh, the other one was Mercurius Politicus or Publicus, and I can't remember which. What a fool I am. After the restoration of Charles II, censorship was reimposed. The 1662 Printed Act restricted the number of presses and reintroduced pre-publication licensing, which meant that um, you couldn't get anything printed without it being um, seen by a member of the Privy Council or a deputy. And uh, there was a particular obnoxious character called Roger, Roger Lestrange who persuaded the king that he was the best person to enforce the, the act. He caused uh, John Twin to be hung, drawn and quartered for publishing unlicensed material. All other papers were suppressed except the London Gazette, which was published by the government. And it was the 17th century English equivalent of Pravda. Um, from, seven, from 1665, it enjoyed a monopoly of printed news, and the late Stuart regime used the London Gazette to help maintain social and political order. The Gazette largely avoided domestic news, apart from royal proclamations and loyal addresses. It projected the image of a nation at peace with itself after the upheavals of the Civil War and the uncertainties of the interregnum. This is a London Gazette, which, unlike its predecessors, which were pamphlets of eight or 16 pages that needed turning, the London Gazette was printed in double columns on both sides of a single sheet of paper. Now, this would enable the busy merchant to see at a glance all the events in Europe in which his business depended could be held in one hand by the man about town in the coffee houses that were springing up all over London and gave rise to the word newspaper a single bit of paper, which was first recorded in 1670. After William of Orange became king, his continental campaigns created such a hunger for news that the existing controls became increasingly untenable. There was an attempt to redraft the Printing Act in 1695, but they ran out of parliamentary time and the Act simply failed to be renewed. But the importance of 1695 meant that anyone could set up a printing press and issue uh, publications without permission. News would no longer be restricted to the information in the London Gazette that the state decided the public should be allowed to know. It would embrace a much wider selection of material, material that the journalists thought the public should have the right to know, a material that journalists thought the public would also enjoy reading. The demand for newspapers in the 18th century was stimulated by the political, social and economic conditions of the times. You had an expanding middle class, an increasingly literate artisan class, a developing party political system that needed an active press to further the battles between the Whigs and the Tories, and a thriving club and coffee house culture whose participants prided themselves on being well informed. In 1712, the government introduced the Stamp Act, which was one of the first taxes of knowledge. It taxed each sheet of paper used to make up the existing two or four page newspapers. But the tax, of course, meant governments were now dependent on newspapers as a source of revenue. So the fears receded that pre-publication licensing would be reintroduced. Opposition papers, such as the Craftsman, Hello, here's a craftsman. The Craftsman, Common Sense, Mist's Weekly Journal. And Miss Weekly Journal actually continued as Fogg's Weekly Journal after Nathaniel Mist fled to France after a particularly foolhardy attack on the government in 1728. Because generally, those involved in the um, opposition press um, led a fairly precarious existence thanks to the law of seditious libel and the general warrant. The law of seditious libel, which taken to its logical conclusion would have prevented any political comment in the press, a sedition was defined as anything that was likely to incite disaffection against the king, his heirs, the government, the houses of parliament and the administration of justice, even when those comments were based on the truth. <laughs> 
and the responsibility for determining whether an article was seditious lay entirely with the judge. The jury's function was simply limited to deciding whether the accused bore some responsibility for the article's publication, you know, hawking it in the streets or selling it in your shop. The general warrant was the main weapon used to intimidate the press. They were called general warrants because they specified the offence and not the offender. They were used to hold in custody large numbers of people who had only the remotest connection with the publication in question, and the warrants were enforced by King's Messages, a gang of hired thugs who had the power to arrest anybody they wanted, to seize property and destroy printed equipment. Many journalists and printers faced heavy fines and imprisonment, some dying in jail. However, because the anti-ministerial papers trod dangerously and were generally more fun, they enjoyed higher sales than those papers that were simply dull apologists for the government, reacting to the agenda set by the opposition press. And the influence of the opposition press was such that Robert Walpole spent over £50,000 <coughs> bribing journalists to support the government. And the newspapers entertained their readers with a glorious display of Grub Street abuse, hack versus hack, in the columns of the ministerial and anti-ministerial papers. However, in the space of eight years, from 1763 to 1771, there were three important victories um, for the freedom of the press. One, general warrants were declared illegal. Two, it became up to the jury to decide whether a publication was a libel and not an establishment judge, as hitherto. And three, newspapers won the right to publish the proceedings of Parliament. The uh, story uh, of these battles for the freedom of the press are well documented, not least in this wonderful book. Um, but as the theme of uh, this series of lectures is oratory, it's worth quoting John Wilkes's uh, declaration in the first issue of his newspaper, The North Britain. The liberty of the press is the birthright of a Briton and is justly esteemed the firmest bulwark in the liberties of this country. It has been the terror of all bad ministers for their dark and dangerous designs all their weakness, inability, and duplicity have thus been detected. Good stuff. Now, of all the non-political weekly uh, journals of the uh, 18th century, the Grub Street Journal, lovely title, sold at the Pegasus, vulgarly called the Flying Horse in Grub Street. It was the most notorious uh, for its propensity for starting quarrels with other writers and generally stirring up trouble. It was thought that the Grub Street Journal was founded as a vehicle for Alexander Pope uh, to attack his many enemies, a continuation of the Dunciad by other means. But we don't know the full extent of Pope's um, involvement um, he contributed numerous verses to the early issues, and the paper went out of its way to pick a fight with anyone he didn't like. Um, but gradually, um, Pope's influence or interest in the paper began to decline, and it began to develop its own character, expanding the range of its satire beyond the confines of Pope's literary squabbles to cover a much wider range of material, including medicine, theology, the theatre, the administration of justice, and other social issues. It attracted a large number of correspondents who used the paper to carry out their squabbles in, squabbles in public while the editors sat back and enjoyed the spectacle, prodding the antagonists into action where necessary. And whenever one controversy looked at, uh, like running out of scheme, the journal would invent a new one to keep up the excitement. Uh, journalism, of course, was one of its main targets. Uh, the preference to the collected essays of the Grub Street Journal explained, to furnish materials for the daily papers, collectors are sent out all over the city, suburbs and surrounding villages to pick up articles of news, who, being paid according to the length and number of them, it is no wonder that so, much, that so few of them are true. And all newspapers may, justly be, may be justly looked upon as the productions of Grub Street. 
The Grub Street Journal um, printed contradictory accounts of the same event taken from the preceding week's newspapers with sarcastic remarks on their discrepancies and inaccuracies and the frequent premature reports of death uh, prompted the Grub Street Journal to make this comment. There is no privilege in which the authors of our daily and weekly papers may more justly glory than of the power and life of death. Whom they will, they send to the grave, and whom they will, they restore to life again. The Archbishop of Canterbury, who, God be thanked, is still living, has often with pleasure and surprise read in these papers the accounts of his own death. We writers of journals are nearer in our styles to that of common talk than any other writers. That's what Richard Steele wrote in the Tatler in 1710. And those common talkers were providing the social backcloth to their times. In compiling their hastily produced paragraphs of news, the news writers were unknowingly writing for posterity. Those few newspapers that have survived from two or three hundred years ago can tell us more about what was important to their readers and the pleasures and dangers of life of their times than any other source. And if Hogarth painted the picture of 18th century life, the newspaper supplied the text. It's reckoned uh, that especially in London, that each copy of a newspaper was seen by up to 40 persons, many hearing the news read aloud in alehouses or on street corners. Yet the type of news in the papers of the early 18th century, foreign news and politics, were of only interest to a small elite. Recognising the wider market, the princes began a gradual shift towards home news, and at a time when there was no effective police force and crime was fuelled by a plentiful supply of cheap gin, newspapers from the 1720s onwards were full of stories of highwaymen, housebreakers and footpads, smugglers, prostitutes and pirates, their trials and their eventual fate on the gallows. Daniel Defoe was one of the first crime reporters, writing for Mist's weekly journal and Appleby's weekly journal. He knew many of the Underwood world characters, including Jonathan Wilde and Mole King. He interviewed Jack Shepard in the condemned cell and was said to have stood on the scaffold, sorry, stood at the scaffold to collect the dying words of convicts. And the newspapers spared no details to illustrate the cruelty of judicial punishment. Here's a report from Reed's weekly journal of the execution of Catherine Hayes, who was burned at the stake in 1726 for murdering her husband. The fuel being placed round her and lighted with a torch, she begged for the sake of Jesus to be strangled first whereupon the executioner drew tight the halter, but the flame coming to his hand in the space of a second, he let it go, and she gave three dreadful shrieks. But the flames taking her on both sides, she was heard no more, and the executioner throwing a piece of timber into the fire, it broke her skull when her, bla her brains came plentifully out, and in about an hour she was entirely reduced to ashes. On a lighter note, <laughs> the newspaper readers probably enjoyed the report of the woman in Glasgow who was indecently assaulted and robbed of six shillings and a bottle of whiskey. When asked in court why she didn't mention the assault, she said she was so concerned about the shillings and the whiskey that she clean forgot the rape. Um, reports of death were a, st a staple fare of the 18th century press, and I like the moralising at the end of this report. Lately died, after 12 days' painful illness, Mr Langford, formerly an eminent farmer and grazier. His death was occasioned by eating a large quantity of cherries and very imprudently swallowing the stones, which produced an obstruction in his bowels terminating in a mortification. Thus fell a hearty hail constitution, a woeful sacrifice to the incautious use of fruit. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> Inserting a moral at the end of a news item was a common device in the 18th century, 
Following the report of an explosion and fire in 1769, uh, the Northampton Mercury f uh, felt it was necessary to advise its readers this ought to be a caution not to keep gunpowder near a forge. <laughs> and here's a contender from 1779 for the title of the world's most inefficient suicide. Yesterday morning, Captain Bruce of Cavendish Square, as is supposed in a fit of insanity, drew a pair of pistols from his pocket and shot himself in the head. But finding that he did not immediately expire, he drew his sword and fell upon it, which struck against a bone and broke. <laughs> his groans alarmed his footman, who in vain attempted to force open the door of the room, but was obliged to get in at the window and alarm the house. A surgeon who lived next door was sent for, who drew p the part of the broken sword from the wound, dressed him and put him to bed. <laughs> but as soon as he found himself alone, he took a large knife and stabbed himself. And strange as it appears, the blade of the knife broke. <laughs> the surgeon again dressed those wounds, and after a time he was left as before. He then got to his pocket, took out a pen knife, cut his throat, laid the knife by his side, and laid himself down and died. <laughs> it was probably fired for inefficiency. Uh, and this report from 1767 combines both death and marriage. Cambridge, September the 18th. Last week died the wife of, Miss, of one Goodwin, a labouring man at Little Shelford in this county. The sorrowful widower, unable to bear the thoughts of a single state, set off the next morning and was married to a woman at Linton. At their return in the evening to Shelford, the dead wife was removed from his bed into a coffin to give way for the new married couple to celebrate their nuptials. The coffin room continued in the room all night. <laughs> and that was summer. <laughs> and in the last two months of 1726, the newspapers were full of the story of Mary Tofts, the woman who gave birth to rabbits. Miss Weekly Journal reported on November the 19th, 1726, from Guildford comes a strange but well-attested piece of news that a poor woman who lives at Godalming near that town was, about a month past, delivered by Mr. John Howard, an eminent surgeon and man midwife, of a creature resembling a rabbit. About 14 days since, she was delivered by the same person of a perfect rabbit, and in a few days after, of four more. And on Friday, Saturday and Sunday, the 4th, 5th and 6th instant, one of one in each day, in all nine. John Howard uh, removed Mary from Godalmin to Guildford and sent letters to various eminent medical men, inviting them to Guildford to see for themselves. Um, Nathaniel St. Andre, the surgeon and anatomist to George II, and another royal surgeon, both came down and delivered rabbits on several occasions. St. Andre went back to London and published a 40-page pamphlet, a short narrative of the extraordinary deliver of delivery of rabbits, while John Howard lectured to the Royal Society. Soon, both the king and the government began to take notice. Now, where the hell is it there? Um, in this paper, this is the postboy. This is how not to construct a sentence, if I can find the damn thing. Ah, oh, yeah. We hear that a very strict inquiry is going to be made into the story of the woman being delivered of 17 rabbits at Godalmin near Guildford in Surrey by order of the government. <laughs> I know it's a bit of an oligarchy in those times and people had to do what they were told, but... Um Anyway, on the 29th of November, Mary was brought to London, where, according to the London Journal of December the 3rd, 1726, great numbers of the nobility have been to see her, and many physicians have attended her in order to make a strict search into the affair. And it was only when a porter admitted smuggling a rabbit in, <laughs> into Mary's chamber, and Mary was threatened with having a very painful operation to get to the truth of the matter, that Mary confessed to having manually inserted rabbits into her vagina and then, <laughs> and then allowed uh, them to be re removed as if giving birth. I know, it makes your eyes water, doesn't it? 
Um, and she was prosecuted under the statute of Edward III as a vile cheat and imposter. She was detained in Tothill's Fields Bridewell, where vast crowds flocked to see her. But in the end, as the Weekly Journal for April the 15th, 1727 reported, Mary Toft, the Godalmin rabbit woman, was last Saturday discharged from her re uh, reconnaissance at the quarter sessions, there being no prosecution. And by and large, the public and the newspapers were satisfied by this outcome. Mary had entertained the public, provided the newspapers with several weeks of sensational material. She had given rise to a host of pamphlets, cartoons, rude songs and poets on the, poems on the subject, including one about sending a chimney sweep's boy up a fallopian tube. <laughs> And she made the medical profession look like a bunch of incompetent fools. <laughs> In the second half, <laughs> the second half of the 18th century saw the dominance of the daily paper. There were daily papers in the first half of the century, starting with the Daily Courant in uh, 1702, but their circulation was uh, mainly restricted to London. By the middle of the century, investment by booksellers and other shareholders provided the capital to print newspapers on a continuous basis, and the introduction of daily posts in the 1740s and the growing appetite for news stimulated by the weekly and tri-weekly papers encouraged the growth of the daily press. And they derived their income from a, a combination of sales, treasury bribes, Money's paid by theatrical agents in return for favourable reviews. Suppression fees, that's advising a subject that a damaging paragraph was in type but could be taken out if a certain fee was paid. And contradiction fees, this is where the subject had responded too late and the paragraph had already been printed but a fee could be paid to have the paragraph contradicted in the next day's paper. Edward Topham, who was the editor of the daily paper The World, turned his paper into a vehicle for blackmail. His most famous exploit was to threaten to expose the Prince of Wales's marriage to uh, Mrs Fitzherbert. Uh, the Prince offered to buy the paper outright for a down, paper of four, down payment of £4,000 plus an annuity for Topham of £400. Uh, Topham refused uh, but accepted the subsidy from the Prince instead. And this was on top of a treasury bribe of 600 a, a year. And it was said that by um, 1780, there was scarcely a paragraph in the Morning Post, the Morning Post, um, that had not been paid by someone. But in most cases, the greatest contribution to the newspaper's income uh, came from the sale of advertising space. Um, they were the newspapers were the dominant vehicle for adverts because no other medium could offer such wide circulation and regular appearance and no other medium could offer such extensive distribution all over the country. Now the quack medicine adverts must have kept whole armies of Grub Street copywriters occupied. Um, my only guess is that they were composed in taverns with the whole company laughing at the next excesses they managed to dream up. Um, they often inserted testimonials from satisfied customers, real or imagined. And during the 1750s, uh, readers of the General Evening Post were entertained each week by adverts for Dr. Henry's nervous medicine. Each week, he would publish a testimonial from a customer who had suffered from wind they couldn't expel, including one from the woman with a windy convulsive disorder in her bowels who was obliged to sit up in bed to discharge the wind. One sufferer testified to the Reading Mercury that Speedyman's stomach pills, by the blessing of God, dispersed the wind in a very surprising manner. <laughs> Probably surprising for anybody who happened to be around at the time. Uh, in, in the newspapers of the first half of the 18th century, there was almost a symmetry of cause and effect with the sellers of aphrodisiacs, like the cordial quintessence of vipers, plying their wares next to cures for venereal disease, which they advertised without hindrance of business or the knowledge of a bedfellow. And uh, but the VD ads. Uh, copy mainly consisted of long lists of symptoms, including scaly pustules, old gleats, buboes, shankers, tumefied testicles, and ulcers on the privates. <laughs>
Oh, Gleets. I, I was thinking, that, you know, if you go to a village pub and sit in a particular chair, somebody's like, oh, you can't sit there. That's old Gleets' chair, and he'll be in in five minutes. And um, those of you who can remember Connie France's Lipstick on Your Collar, uh, which is a song about he comes back with lipstick on a co his collar, which proved he was untrue, the unsuccessful follow-up was not ulcers on your privates. Um, in 1734, one advert, um, I've got the advert here actually in this London Evening Post, um, boasted that in 19 years his medicine had caused 673 gonorrheas or claps and promised to cure all the dismal attendants of impure embraces, nay, even if you piss through a dozen holes. <laughs> and I always think about that when I'm in the garden with my watering can. <laughs> the, <laughs> I think I'm going to have... Ah, no, The Times. Mustn't forget The Times, must we? There it is, The Times. It was the most successful morning paper of the 19th century for a combination of factors. Um, one of them was sending uh, William Howard Russell um, to report during the Crimean War, and his descriptions of the mismanagement brought down the government. Here's an extract from the Times' uh, leading article of December the 23rd, 1854. The noblest army ever sent from these shores has been sacrificed to the greatest mismanagement Incompetency, lethargy, aristocratic hauteur, official indifference, favour, routine, perverseness and stupidity reign, a revel and riot in the camp before Sebastopol, in the harbour of Balaclava, in the hospital of Scutari, and how much nearer home we dare not venture to say. I'm only saying all that because one of the themes is oratory, isn't it? That's right, isn't it? A jolly good. Okay, it's <laughs> fine. Um... The thing, though, that newspapers after the abolition of the Stamp Act uh, cost a penny, but they didn't enjoy many large sales because they were so full of um, turgid speeches um, and... Um, and the only form of entertainment, really, was provided by reports from the divorce courts, uh, where the Victorian newspapers treated their readers to the salacious details of juicy divorce cases. And these included the Crawford versus Crawford case in 1886, where Sir Charles Dilk, who was tipped to become Foreign Secretary in the next Gladstone administration, was accused of having three-in-a-bed sex with Mrs Crawford and a girl named Fanny. And in the same year, the Campbell versus Campbell case, where Lord Colin Campbell was accused of adultery, cruelty, and giving Lady Campbell venereal disease, while he accused her of adultery with a duke, a doctor, a general, and the chief of the London Fire Brigade. <laughs> Uh, the reports of the Campbell case, which were described by the Pall Mall Gazette as the filthiest divorce case on record, took up 74 columns of the Daily Chronicle, 46 columns of the Standard, 44 columns of the Daily News, 43 columns of the Daily Telegraph, and 26 columns of the Times. The Pall Mall Gazette pointed out that the Daily Chronicle had devoted about 180,000 words to the Campbell case, which are compared to the 181,258 words in the New Testament. <laughs> and there was a case in 1863 where a man named Cain claimed his wife had committed adultery with Lord Palmerston, then in his 78th year, and that inspired the joke, she was Cain, but was he able? <laughs> I'm going to have... I mean, really, the only newspapers that kind of appealed to the working class um, were the Sunday, Sunday papers. Um, and um, an example here is uh, Pierce Egan's Life in London. Um, it specialised in lurid descriptions of bare-knuckle boxing matches, cockfighting, bull and badger baiting, and reports from the London police courts. 
Um, and the Sunday papers took much of their material from the Penny Aligners, who are an uh, anonymous tribe of uh, semi-literate Bohemians. They were like the lineal descendants of the Grub Street Journal's news collectors. They haunted the police courts for their low-life low material. They reported fires and minor casualties, attended coroner's inquests. Um, the inquest must have been convivial affairs for the Penny Aligners, as they were usually held in a pub and armed with what material they could find and padded out with descriptive embellishments and exuberant verbosity, the longer the piece, the greater the profit, the penny liners hawked their stories from newspaper office to newspaper office, hoping to fire, find a buyer. And one of the most enterprising of the tribe was a chap who was named Fire Fowler. He lodged with a fireman and became something of a mascot with a brigade. The firemen let him travel to the fires on their fire engine, so whenever there was a fire, he was always first with the news. I th I'm going to skip um, stuff about the uh, Sunday papers. Um, towards the end of the century, I mean, one of the things about the, m the most successful uh, Sunday paper was selling a million when the daily paper, the largest daily paper, was only in about five uh, five figures, um, uh, and that was Lloyd's uh, Lloyd's newspaper. And um, one of Lloyd's managers explained their method of selecting material for inclusion in the paper. We sometimes mistrust our own judgment and place the manuscript in the hands of an illiterate person, a servant or machine boy, for, for instance. And if they pronounce favorably upon it, we think it will do. And a contributing factor to the success of Lloyd's and its uh, rivals like this famous paper, The News of the World, late lamented or unlamented, um, was that their readers were encouraged to accept the papers as part of their lives. Uh, the papers would answer queries from correspondents on all matters of concern to their readers, and unlike the more patrician daily papers, they adopted the role as the people's friend. When Matilda w Wood was searching for a stage name that would be remembered in the music halls, she chose the name of Marie Lloyd because she knew that the, the name Lloyd was well known and popular with the audiences. But it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that the gap in the market for popular daily papers were filled, initially by the Star, which was a halfpenny evening paper in 1888, which promised to do away with the Bose and Prolix articles, and the Daily Mail in 1896, one Daily Mail, uh, which was a halfpenny morning paper featuring inside clear headlines and short and easy to read paragraphs and the Daily Mail paved the way for the Daily Express in 1900 and the Daily Mirror in 1903. And also by the end of the 19th century Fleet Street had become synonymous with the newspaper trade. By the 1880s all the major national dailies and Sunday papers um, had their main offices in Fleet Street or close by. Because almost since Caxton first introduced the craft of printing in this country, Fleet Street had been associated with the printing industry. In 1500, Winking D. Word moved from Caxton's house in Westminster to set up his press in Fleet Street opposite Shoe Lane. In the same year, Richard Pineson, who later became the King's printer, opened his printing office in the corner of Fleet Street and Chantry Lane. Thereafter, Fleet Street and the Strand and the alleys and lanes that ran off those streets became home to an emergent printing industry that served the aristocratic, legal and ecclesiastical houses that were dotted like a string of pearls along the Thames from Somerset House to Whitefriars. And Fleet Street was also the ideal place for gathering and exchanging news. Situated in the no man's land between Westminster and the city, hard by the law courts, close to the red light district of Drury Lane and Covent Garden, news of national politics, city politics, trade and finance, crime and sex converged in Fleet Street. And it's no coincidence that many of the first coffee houses were started in Fleet Street. Coffee houses were centres of news and gossip where, according to contemporary accounts, the common uh, greeting was, 
What news have you? However, I was amused the other day to come across this content. It's observable that Fleet Street abounds with more whores and thieves than any other street in London. That wasn't a member of Hacked Off. It, was, um, it appeared in the Ipswich Journal for February the 28th, 1736. But whether they're the newspapers of Grub Street or Fleet Street, the beauty of these newspapers is that they give more of an immediate sense of past experience in all its complexity, humour and humanity than almost any other kind of literature. To paraphrase the news of the world, all human life was there. Thank you very much.